What is up, future Sickos listeners? As always, I'm joined by my co-host and Derek Lee today, and another pretty cool guest. And uh, I I want to make sure I get this name right. It's James D- Duffy? Duthy? Duthy. 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 Okay, perfect. perfect. Duchy. Thank you. Yeah. Duchy. The amount and of times from- I uh, nobody gets that right ever is uh, hilarious. So uh, <laughs> Otto is probably my best bet of people being able to say that name correctly. That's well. We just got to spread spread it around. It's it's doofy, everyone. Get get on it. Make sure you spread it properly. Um, welcome to the show, James. From what I understand, you're somewhat known in smaller hockey, football, golf, soccer communities. Currently, have like eight hundred seventy thousand followers on Twitter, which is a pretty decent start. I mean, you're not at a million yet, but maybe I'm no Bob McKenzie. We'll see. No, no Bob no, McKenzie. No, no Bobby Margarita <laughs> level. And you, you've also been on some TV broadcasts and a motion picture, uh, which is pretty cool. There was like a solid, there was like two minutes. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty it was something special. Um, are, you so, about, uh, are you talking about my uh, dabble in porn in the 90s? <laughs> I, I was just hoping you could bring the mustache back. I I, I know it, it's it's looking good trimmed, but um, I don't know. That's that's got me yeah. through. Goon, yeah. I, it's a, it's still a disappointment to me that Goon Two didn't get more Oscar buzz. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm surprised. Like for a supporting actor or or something that um kind of, kind of shocked me a little bit. I must admit. You know what's um, funny about that movie? Real quickly to sidetrack yeah. you already. <laughs> uh, we love it. So Jay Baruchel, I, I know a little bit, and uh, he called me and asked me to be in the movie, and uh, we shot it all at TSN, and and I fully expected it to be all end up on the cutting room floor, right? It was just, it was. We filmed for about an hour. And uh, I thought it was just maybe the one line or maybe we'd appear in the background or something. And then I got invited to the the premiere and freaking every line that we taped was in the movie. <laughs> and I wish I at that point I'd gotten paid more than six hundred and twelve dollars or whatever I got paid for the film. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I think basically Jay explained to me afterwards that any time they had a plot hole, they just used us on the set to get us from to get them from like one scene to another to help tell the story. So, uh, yeah, that's probably my first and only, uh, uh, big screen performance. Well, maybe it shouldn't be because I was actually trying to find some clips. I was going to maybe try to work it into the interview here, but, um, and, and whenever I searched it up, I just typed in your name and goon too. And a lot of people were like, what a disappointment, but James Duffy <laughs> really, really pulled the movie together. <laughs> yeah. he, he was the act that made, that made it was it such, a, such a stretch the role I played playing James Duffy sports center host. <laughs> really had that throw on your acting hat there. That's right. Oh uh, well, actually, one thing I am kind of curious about is you do you team you tend to throw your own spin on things. I mean, at least I feel as a listener, you're tend you have a tendency to go off script, and I mean, it works incredibly well for you. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have like a fairly long leash when it comes to throwing in your little your duthyisms or or how how exactly that works. Do a lot of them get written in. Do you work with people beforehand? Like, how what does that look like? Uh, no, I don't, I, I, yes, I have a long leash, I guess I would say. We, we don't really have a script for, uh, any of the shows I do. When I, when I used to host Sports Center, uh, and I'll do a little, if I'm getting too inside baseball here, just shut me up, but, uh, you know, Sports Center has a teleprompter, and, uh, you write, you know, your intro to whatever highlights or whatever feature you're doing, and, so most of the time they're working off a teleprompter and they get scripts for highlights. But when we do, um, you know, sends games or whatever hockey games we do, World Juniors, there's there's no script. Well, you know, we have a meeting beforehand and we talk about things. Um, but you're pretty much at liberty to to say whatever you want, which is dangerous, frankly. But uh, especially today, I always feel like you're on the brink of saying something disastrous by mistake. Uh, today when everyone is uh, so ultra sensitive about every everything right but uh and i think that's the fun part of tv i could use a teleprompter if i wanted to for you know if i'm introducing a a big feature on tim stutzler or something i i could but i always feel like it's the test and someday when i'm if i if they keep me around and i start to go see now it's already happening i'll probably use one someday but right now it's my own personal test 
um, that I don't want one because that's, look at, it's not a very dangerous uh, life that I lead, but that's my idea of walking on the tightrope <laughs> is, is trying to talk off the cuff and knowing that you could completely lose your train of thought and look like an idiot on, you know, national TV or regional TV. And that's what's fun to me. So I don't like using it. I found when I did Sports Center that I wouldn't be concentrating. You can read a teleprompter and you can, I was, my mind would start to wander off. I'd be thinking about my golf round the next day or whatever, right? Because you just become like a machine reading the prompter. And then if something goes wrong with the teleprompter, you're kind of screwed. So I, I always like working with that one because I think it keeps you sharper and hopefully more conversational with, with the audience. One thing I'll say just before I, I let Derek uh, chime in on his question is I know Gord Downey, when when he did his last tour, he had what was it like 13 or 12 different prompters up and uh, to, to remember all the lyrics to a song. He absolutely rocked that show. So if you ever yeah, get amazing. to a point where you need to have uh, 12, 12 prompters <laughs> up or anything like that, I'm, I'm sure you'll rock it just the same, James. Hey, man, if I get that far in life and they still want to put me on television, uh, then uh, <laughs> that will be a, a victory for me. Nice. Do you ever like practice in the mirror or in the car? Is that like, or or is that like old school? You're like past that point now and you don't really have to think about it. I don't do it anymore, but I used to. It was funny. I was just, I was getting together with a bunch of Ottawa high school buddies on the weekend. Uh, I've been like, my best friends are mostly my best friends. since like grade three. Shout out to Glen Ogilvie Public School in Blackburn Hamlet and Gloucester High School. And we got together up in Peterborough. And I don't know what, why we brought that up. Um, but we were taught people were, I think, I think I was doing like, we'd had a couple of beers and I was doing some commentary in the back seat of the car. And, uh, they were saying, do you do that? Like by yourself? And when I was in young in my broadcasting career, and I actually tell this to young broadcasters, I would do that. Like if I was driving home from work, I'd say, okay, I'm going to talk about the sends for 10 straight minutes and try to talk about them and not screw up, not say, um, <laughs> or, ah, uh, and all those things that we say in normal conversation. And so that's how I would practice. I probably look like an idiot at, back in at red lights before there were cell phones and everybody's talking at red lights, but back in the day, that's what I would do. All I would talk to myself all the way home because broadcasting is a weird job. Like you can get better at it by doing stupid things like that. And so I, I would do that all the time. In fact, this is now really embarrassing because I was you know, probably 28 years old at the time, but I would drive home and pretend I was in a car race and commentate on the car race i'd sit here i'd be sitting here going all right duffy's looking pretty good now he's going to go into the left lane he's going to pass that little corolla oh what a move brilliant uh, so that was a real geek. I, I, I don't know if it helped or not but uh that's what i would do uh, back when i was working at cjoh tv in ottawa and dreamed of being a sportscaster that's how i would practice that's awesome advice actually like i, I find myself saying um uh a lot <laughs> And we all do like normal, con it. like, right? In normal conversation, yeah. we all yeah. do it. But that's one of the, there's not a ton of skills in broadcasting, I think, but that's one of the skills is just to be able to speak and keep speaking without falling back on all the tendencies we have in, in normal conversation. Absolutely. I I just have a vision of you like watching all of your dogs go go at their food and just commentating the whole thing as they they race <laughs> down right. their their meals right. now. And I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this image in my head moving forward. That's right, Hugo with a slight lead on Willow, but here is Willow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a sad thing. Uh, so James, um, you're an Ottawa guy, as you mentioned. Um, how connected are you to the city today? And was it special for you in any way when the team arrived in the city? Uh, I think my heart is forever connected. I'm not connected too much there uh, besides hanging out with my friends. A bunch of my friends still live there. Uh, my f my sister is just moving uh, away from there, but I have cousins and nephews and everyone's sort of in the Ottawa area or Kingston area right now. Uh, so that's my connection. I don't get back nearly enough. Uh, Senators games were my number one way of going back. And unfortunately we haven't been going as often, which would, which bothers me. I'd love to come back and do at least one a month and be in that great set we have in the building. But yeah, I, I will always, you know, rep Ottawa. It'll always be my hometown for forever and ever. I'll always defend it and, and, uh, 
and brag about it. And it does matter. Uh, when the Sens came back, I was still a news reporter in, in Ottawa and got to cover the story, got to cover opening night. And that was a massive, massive thrill for me growing up in the city and not thinking there would ever be an NHL team. I grew up a 67s kid. I had a big Steve Marringer button. You guys would not know that reference, probably. Uh, undersized defenseman who was my idol uh, playing for the 67s. My dad would take me most Friday nights to go see 67s games. and I never dreamt that they would get an NHL team. So that was fantastic. And the same thing on the football side of it. Uh, when I often tell people, when they ask me my the biggest moments of my career, my favorite moments, the Red Blacks winning that Grey Cup is in the top five because I spent my entire youth sitting there at Frank Clair Stadium with my folks and and to have them uh, win a Grey Cup. My dad passed away three years ago and I think it was a year before was the year before that the Red Blacks won. So we knew he didn't have a ton of time left. And he's the most diehard Ottawa football fan ever ever. And for me to be on stage presenting the Grey Cup to them in, in my role with TSN, that was that was very cool. I, I get uh, accused of being a homer by by non-Ottawa fans, and I, I really do stay impartial as much as I can. But that night, I I did want them to win uh, more for my pops than anything else. But just to to have that moment was very cool. Uh, that's a great story. Um, so were you like an immediate Sens fan at the time when they moved to the city, or like you said, do you have to like stay completely impartial, or were you like deeply rooted already in another team? <laughs> Can you even answer that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was I, I was deeply rooted in the Islanders. I will admit to being a complete uh, bandwagon guy when I was a kid. My first introduction to hockey was uh, the, there was a player named Cliff Coral uh, who was on the Chicago Blackhawks. And when I was a baby, we lived in Edmonton. I moved from Ottawa to Edmonton before coming back to Ottawa. And we lived next to Cliff Coral's family. So as soon as I was old enough, you know, to walk and understand things. My dad said, oh, you know, you, you used to live next door to the Chicago Blackhawks. So Cliff Coral became my instant favorite player. And that was my indoctrination into hockey was getting up every day and, and looking at the paper to read the box score for the Blackhawks game and seeing if Cliff Coral had any points. And then as I got a little bit older, Danny Potvin, because of the Ottawa connection, became my favorite player. And so I kind of followed him to the NHL and the Islanders became my team, which was amazing timing uh, with, with the dynasty, dynasty that they had there. So I was an Islanders fan. And when the Sens came, look, I wasn't covering sports at the time. I was a news reporter, so I probably could have been a fan. I don't think you can help rooting for your hometown team to succeed just because it's great for your hometown. Uh, when I moved into sports in Ottawa, that the first year they 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 got back to the playoffs when Ronnie Tugnut was in goal and they had that series against Buffalo and I traveled with them in that series and that was my first time I'd ever covered a playoff series. So, look, I, I think as a sportscaster, you always want the team to succeed because it's more fun for you on the job. But, and you know, some of the Toronto guys here that work at TSN still accuse me of being a Sens fan. Uh, I, I think that. I'll take some, some of that's legit only because my parents love them so much. But I, I, I can say to you 100% truthfully that this job sucks the fan out of you. Uh, and you don't end up cheering for teams. You end up cheering for guys you like, players you like to succeed, but you don't. You really don't cheer for, for teams. And so I would love to see the Sens succeed because I love Ottawa. And I have so many friends there, and my mom still watches the Sens and cares about them. But I, I could care less. Uh, Bob and Mackenzie and I always joke we're uh, we're very selfish. So, uh, like when it comes to playoff time, we cheer for the cities that have you know the best restaurants and weather. So when we go to the Stanley Cup final for two weeks, that uh, you know we could have some good dinners and it, it'll be sunny and, and decently. I was hey, sorry, this will be uh, one of my uh, frequent interruptions on the. Uh, this was uh, when I was on the cover of that Ottawa magazine. I think you guys used in the promo for this. Uh, this was my yeah. co-star. He is uh, Hugo, my third dog, and my most um, trouble-making dog. He's a, he's a giant pain in the ass. And the dog that you might be able to see in the background is Willow, uh, who's my oldest Frenchie, and she's usually sleeping like that. And uh, Hugo just 
<laughs> she's a complete and utter pain in the ass jumping on her all the time. And so uh, I spend most of my uh, waking hours uh, just separating my dogs. It was great for you to, to keep busy, I know, uh, with, with that career as well. But when you're able to come home and, and have that going on, I, I think you can see the the little bit of, I don't know if I want to say crazy in Hugo's eyes, but there's a, there's a little something there. Oh, yeah. no, nonetheless, so, though, that was quite, crazy there. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite the uh, photo for faces, though, nonetheless. Is that, are you a big turtleneck guy normally? Is that kind of, is that your <laughs> GQ look? Is that, you know, it was funny. I I was just in very just I'm in hoodie and pants right now, which is what I wear all the time, and or shorts. And she said we have like I besides I have a ton of suits because of my job, and then I have crap like this, and I have nothing in between. And so she actually bought me like three turtlenecks. So it's gonna be turtlenecks all winter long now for me. I have no idea if turtlenecks are 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 in, but they're gonna be because that's uh <laughs> that's basically all I have. Well, they're in now. You just got to, yeah, <laughs> as long as exactly. you're walking around, walking exactly. around the area with them. Um, one one thing I wanted to ask you actually, just about the kind of previous tangent you went on. You said that you don't really cheer cheer for teams specifically, which or mm -hmm. it sucks the fan out of you. And if anything, I'm kind of happy to hear that because at least you're not a Leaf or Habs fan, and we, we can <laughs> I think we can take peace with that. But you said that there's a few players that you really root for, and that's kind of part of the job. Is is there certain guys that uh, you, that you really root for. So I'm curious if there's any of those that are just favorites for you, whether it just be like your personal connection to them. I'm sure when Obi won a cup, it was a huge one, but oh, I don't know what's going on behind us. Are you <laughs> seeing the scene? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yeah, so this is exactly what I mean. Hey, leave her alone. Leave her alone. I Poor girl just trying to get some sleep. Personal yeah, dog fighting ring in the back. That's really annoying. Um, yeah, so... Well, here's an example, Daniel Albertson uh, back in the day. So Alfie and I were rookies at the same time. My first year covering sports in Ottawa was Alfie's rookie season. You guys have probably seen because TSN's run it about 20 times this clip from a feature I did with him buying Pop-Tarts, rocking a grocery cart down the aisle. I think we've used <laughs> it about a hundred times before. And so, you know, Alfie uh, was sort of, one of the first guys I got to know and he was just a quality guy. And so that was a guy I always rooted for uh, from start to finish. I don't have a lot of hockey player friends and I kind of do that intentionally. Uh, I don't think you, if you get too close to somebody, I don't know how you cover them normally uh, for the most part. Um, I like, like the insiders, I think do an unbelievable job. You know, to have to know every coach in the league and general manager and assistant general manager, you know, they almost have to be friends or be friendly with them in order to develop those relationships. But I've always tried to be the opposite and sort of be the outsider so I can say whatever I want. Uh, and I'm not saying those guys don't, but you know what I mean? That that's part of their job is to is to uh, be able to get information out of these guys and you have to have the relationships to get them. So I try to intentionally avoid that so that as a host i can just be the fan and hopefully ask the questions or say the things that the fan might be thinking without any sort of personal uh relationships involved now that's not always the case i got to be pretty good buddies with luongo all the features we did on tsn uh, so there's a guy i always rooted for um so you know people i've i've, I've met a lot del zotto is another good example uh who's supposed to play a key role for you guys this year. Uh, we played golf a bunch of times over the last couple of years. And I remember when we were first playing, it was when he wasn't sure he was going to get a contract last year. Was he, was he going to go to Europe or was he going to have to retire? And I, I root for guys like that who, you know, are professionals who really want to play and he gets a break in Columbus and has a great year and turns that into a contract in Ottawa. So, um, those are the kind of people and things that I root for. I don't, yeah, you know, Ovi, Sid, I've always been a big fan of Sid just because I think he, he treats people with a lot of respect and understands the game and has always been very kind to me. So, but there's a lot of guys I cheer for. I think there's a lot of pretty good people in hockey. 
Well, I think that you just touched on some some examples of some really great stories, but there's also just some other ones where I, I'm sure whenever there's any crazy story or any guy that's faced a lot of adversity, it, it's pretty easy to root for him. I also really appreciated the growling in the in the background while <laughs> while that was going on. I think that's going to add a nice little element to this. Um, I'm trying to get rid that, of them. I'm trying to get rid of them. No, 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 please don't. We we're we're adding uh, what what they bring. They're real the real stars of the show here. But yeah. I, I uh, speaking of stories and adversity, one thing that I did kind of want to talk about, and it's a pretty decent transition, is that now there must have been a time where you weren't always the man on the left. And essentially, every hockey fan knows you are. Um, but I'm curious if you could give us a bit of a synopsis on your journey to becoming, in my opinion, the face of hockey broadcasting, the big, not, a, not a big deal. And then also just any adversity that you might have faced kind of fulfilling that uh, throughout it. So kind of to link link those stories back to your own yeah i mean i'll, I'll try to give you a quick version because there is a long version that's uh that's pretty heavy and uh i, I don't want to i don't want to bog down your podcast with it but uh i was you know like uh probably yourselves i wanted to be an athlete pretty realized pretty early that i wasn't going to be a professional athlete actually i was kind of delusional I was going to go to McGill and play football. It was the one uh, one school that recruited me hard from Gloucester to play football, and I I really thought that I had a chance to like make the CFL and then play for the Niners or something. You know, I'd play two years in the CFL and then probably the Niners would find me and I'd spend seven years with the Niners and win a couple of Super Bowls. I thought that in grade you know twelve uh, as a you know five ten hundred and fifty five pound defensive back with mediocre speed. Uh, is it extremely but, specific. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was pretty delusional. Uh, anyway, kind of smartened up and went to Carlton for journalism and thought, look, if I could be a sports broadcaster, that would be the next best thing to being an athlete. Got sidetracked to be a news reporter for several years in Ottawa, covering fires and murders and all those things, just because there weren't a lot of jobs in sports back then. I uh, got my break in a very uh, um, unfortunate way, but. Uh, did sports for a while and went to Vancouver and then got hired by TSN. And my dream was to do play by play. I think like, I don't think a lot of people dream of being a host when they start out. Right. And as much as I loved hockey, I, I wanted to do football play by play. If you'd asked the 12 year old me or the 16 year old me, I probably would have said football play by play was my dream. And I actually started doing that uh, for the CFL in my early career, which you guys are too young to remember, I was I started by hosting CFL and NBA at TSN. Then I did Sports Center for a couple of years with uh, Dutch and Rod Smith, and then I was starting to do play by play. I did about ten CFL games over a couple of years, and thought that that was my track. And then the hockey, we got the hockey rights back, and they offered me the hockey job, and that's how it happened. Now, uh, we talk about adversity and different things. I I, I didn't. I wasn't really super interested in the hockey job at first as much as I loved hockey because I was doing this football play-by-play -play, and they hired a woman to host the NHL on TSN when they got rights back in 2002, 2003. And two days before the season, it wasn't working out. Um, they didn't feel she was ready. She didn't feel she was ready. And my, I remember my boss called me on a Sunday night and said, can I come over to your house? And you know, I'd, I had a good relationship with my boss, but he never wanted to come to my house before. And so I said, okay. And, and he, uh, I figured something was up and the season started on Tuesday, I think that year. And he came over and we went for a walk and asked me if I'd, I wanted to be the host of the NHL on TSN. And, and, uh, it was, you know, you just can't, I hadn't really even thought about it. Uh, but once you start to think about it and think about, people who've done those jobs national hosting in canada and how much hockey meant to me growing up it was impossible to say no to that so uh said yes and uh um somehow they haven't gotten rid of me for 20 years and uh just to kind of add on to that a little bit i i heard a bit of a story of what tsn or that that job was originally like for you whether it be like a monkey that was that was on set and yeah. everything so what, what was it like then versus now it sounds like it's changed quite a bit yeah, it was, uh, it was really strange for me. So I get hired on that Sunday. I go into work on the Monday, and I had really no idea what I was getting into. And the vision back then was to create this, uh, this free-flowing show 
MTV was big back then and much music where the VJs would walk around. It was very informal. So they had Dave Hodge and Bob McKenzie in one corner of the set and they were going to be the voices, of, you know, the analysts. And then they had, we had this rank with synthetic ice in the back. Some of this exists probably on YouTube. Um, that like the studio was massive and I sort of sat on this Royal chair at the top with this winding staircase and yeah, we, the monkey came a couple of years later. We had puppets that were supposed to tell jokes at the beginning of the show, kind of like, sort of like Wayne and Garth uh, from Wayne's World, but they were terrible. <laughs> and and there was live bands. We had live bands every night uh, playing. And so it was it was pure chaos. And some of it was great, and some of it was awful. Uh, I'm sure if social media was around back then, we would have got completely and utterly roasted. But it was it was a lot of fun. It slowly morphed back into normalcy. Uh, you know, I think it took two or three years, and then we figured, look, people, hockey fans in this country, they don't want a ton of bells and whistles. They want solid hockey analysis. And so we went back to a panel, and we were fortunate enough to have really good people. Uh, you know, like Bob was always on the other end, and I always say that I owe. If people think I'm credible on the job. I probably owe half of that to having Bob McKenzie on the other side of the panel for most of my career, right? Because I think he just, some of that credibility just oozes across the desk. So yeah, we became more normal after two or three years, but it was nuts. That monkey thing was, uh, they, they got a monkey from the Bowmanville Zoo, which is a, kind of a shady zoo near, <laughs> near Toronto. I don't know what zoo is really giving out your monkey to go on a TV show. And uh, Maggie the monkey would sit on my shoulder and spin a wheel and predict playoff games. And yeah, I was, I look back at some of those times and it's, it, it's chaotic, but it was, it was kind of fun. And as a broadcaster, it was, it was neat because you were doing, I was com constantly walking around and uh, it was, and it was fun for me creatively to be able to do a lot of silly things, I think, but uh I'm glad that it changed back to some sort of normalcy because <laughs> my career might have been ruined. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> what was it like working with, I know you mentioned him a couple of times already, but uh, we got to talk about Bobby Margarita. What was it like mm -hmm. working with a legend like Bob McKenzie? Well, I hope to still work with him for several years. I mean, he's not gone, right? He's just not around as much and we'll do the world juniors together. Hopefully is until they kick us out. But, uh, yeah, it was, you know, I, but it was funny. The best story I can tell about Bob is that every analyst we had in there over the years, no one would ever contradict Bob because I think they were just all intimidated by his voice of authority and his wisdom. We've probably had 30 ex coaches or coaches between jobs and 40 players. Uh, rotating through those seats over the years. And there was always, I could tell if there was intimidation of them coming and sitting in that chair, it wasn't just because of the lights and the cameras for the first time, but, you know, sitting next to Bob McKenzie because, and they would always hesitate. Bob would make a point, and even if a guy didn't agree, he'd go, yeah, Bob, you're probably right, <laughs> right? Just because <laughs> uh, you know, Bob is really good at, taking difficult issues and synthesizing points really well. So uh, I think he was, it was, it was great to have him bookend the panel uh, with me all these years. And we became, you know, he's one of the best friends. Uh, we spent time at cottages together in the summer. We, he's into golf now. So we golf a dozen times in the summer and uh, uh, share a lot of the same interests. So that's been the best part for me is getting to be really good buds with him. Who's the better golfer? I even think Bob would admit I'm the better golfer between the, the two of us. Uh, but there's that doesn't necessarily mean I'm great. Bob's still learning. Fair enough. You know, you might be to fault for his retirement if you got him into golf. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think he enjoys it a little bit too much. He always bugs me when he goes down to Florida in the winter and sends me pictures while we're freaking freezing up here of him on some – beautiful course with palm trees but uh he i i can't say enough the grind that all these guys have whether it's aaron drager or uh pierre lebron or elliot on the other side or chris johnson 
you know, all the, all the best insiders in the business, man, they have to have their phones, you know, semi permanently attached to their ear. And I, you know, Dregs is involved told me at times, you know, during the trade deadline period that literally their, uh, you know, their phone is six inches from their ear when they go to bed at night, because if something happens in the middle of the night or somebody texts them, they have to be there. And I just, I can't function like that. I need to, when I get off work, I need to have a life outside of the job. Uh, we all live hockey and I love it, but I need to get away from it for a few hours in the evening. So I just, I have so much respect for what all those guys do because I think it legitimately is 24 seven and frankly, almost all year now, right? They try to, they turn it off a little bit in the, in the summer, but it's a it's a full time gig, and I think that Bob doing that forever and being the best at it forever that it did it did wear him out. Uh, not necessarily the being on TV, but just constantly having to be completely up to date on everything. And it's you know different than being in Ottawa where you're just covering Sens. They have to know what's going on in every city of the National Hockey League. So I, I think that's a that's an exhausting job. So I'm happy that he's. Uh, you know, found some time away now and uh, has a bit of more cushy gig right now. So Bobby Margarita deserves his golf is, is what I'm hearing. And then I'm happy that he's, uh, I'm happy that he's getting that. If it's uh, so well-deserved and I mean, it to- totally is. I know that all hockey fans have nothing but the most love and respect for him and mm-hmm. re- really appreciate you sharing that with us. I um all jokes aside, I guess you you have had a really incredibly established career. Um, I know for a fact that fans want you to be the, in the industry for many, many more years. However, I'm curious. Let's say if you were to retire tomorrow, just like Bob McKenzie. Well, I guess he's not technically retired, but if you were to retire tomorrow, what are the three memories you would look back on and think to yourself, like, wow. That was special. I, I'm so blessed to have been able to experience that. I know that you already mentioned the uh, Ottawa Red Blacks winning yeah. their Grey Cup, but uh, maybe some other examples too. Uh, uh, well, number one would have to be the 2010 Olympics. I was an Olympic absolute geek when I was a kid. I lived in Blackburn Hamlet. Do you guys know Blackburn Hamlet? Yeah. So there's a, no a green belt. Is. <laughs> <laughs> so you take the queens away get off at montreal road uh head towards orleans and you turn right on what is it bearbrook i guess it goes all the way up there anyway um i lived on a street called valewood crescent and it backed on to the green belt onto a, like a toboggan hill and i remember my dad greens bought creek, me these uh, right? huh greens creek Right around Greens Creek. Greens Creek is a toboggan okay. hill, but if you go a little farther yeah. in, there was a smaller toboggan hill behind my house. So, okay. Uh, Horst Bulau uh, was, was a ski jumper, an Olympic ski jumper who went to my high school, Gloucester High School. So, uh, I guess my sister knew him. I probably was in grade six or something. And I thought, wow, this Olympian he actually goes, lives in my neighborhood. And I, my dad bought me these crappy $5 cross country skis at some change at the school. And I built like a ski jump. And I would go and try and like do like, you know, the old ski jumper position. I would try to do this on these little cross country seats. I probably got like three feet in the air. I felt like I was going 60 feet. And that's just my long winded way of telling you that I just love the Olympics. I loved everything about the Olympics. So when Vancouver got the Olympics and I was fortunate enough to host, and I kind of had a dual role where I hosted during the day with Lisa LaFlam, CTV national news anchor. And then I would go down and do the hockey games at night with, uh, Bob and Darren Pang and Nick Kiprios, I think, of the panel. And to me, that was uh, exhausting, but two of the best weeks of my life just to, you know, first of all, Vancouver was unbelievable during those two weeks. The whole country was electric. You guys, you know, how, I don't know how old you were, but how great was those? We remember those that one. I, that was still <laughs> yeah. the best week of my life, I think. So. Right, right. <laughs> and to be, uh, I tell a story in my book, but when Crosby scored, scored the goal, we had a really cool set that uh, sort of it was a retractable set right above the Zamboni entrance to the rink. So during the period, we would actually sit in the stands with the fans, and then the period would end, and the set would kind of pop out over the Zamboni area, and that's where we do our commentary. So I was probably 30 feet away from where uh, uh, Crosby scored the goal, and I was actually, my son was playing a playoff game back home in Barrie. 
And I was on the phone. Somebody was texting me trying to get an update on his game and was not paying attention for a second and actually heard Sid yell Iggy and sort of gazed up on my phone and saw the goal go in. And uh, that was, we were going back to what we were talking about, about being a fan. That was a really difficult point in my career because as a Canadian, look, I wanted to go nuts. People were throwing beers everywhere and going crazy. It was one of the greatest moments in Canadian sports history. And I wanted to do the same thing, but you can't as a host, right? So I had to keep it all contained and think about what I was going to say when we went on the air a couple minutes later. So uh, that's always number one. I, I don't think anything will ever pass that in my career uh, to be able to be a part of that Olympics and, uh, and, and cover that team and, and that goal. Uh, beyond that, uh, you know, every World Juniors is a treat. Uh, the one in Ottawa is one of my favorites. Uh, the Everly goal uh, in that moment, uh, you know, pride in your hometown. That, that stuff does matter to me. And, you know, that was one of the best World Juniors, I think, that was ever put on in Ottawa. Uh, my parents were, were sitting on the set with me that game and they, they hated traffic. So I told them to leave with two minutes left to beat the traffic and they missed the Everly goal. They never forgave me for that. Uh, so that one, and, and I, I get to cover the Masters every year, uh, which is always a thrill. I love golf as well. And when Tiger won there in 2019, uh, to be there for that, I think was that'll always be right up there as well. So I, you know, I've been super, super lucky to, it, it's hard for me to make a list. I can make a top 30 list for you of my favorite things I've been to. Um, but those are some of them. Just uh, two things on that. One of my good friends was there for the, the I don't know, the Tiger comeback kind of when he, right. uh, the, the regression. He said that there was like no one following him. Like when he was able, like he he went and watched Tiger on that last day. And he said there was just like, uh, it, was, it was really open. And it was just like such a cool experience because you could get like so close to them. I don't know if you felt that I, way as I'm well. Sh- I'm, comp- I'm utterly shocked by that. Okay. Because uh, the hardest thing about covering the Masters is that, uh, it's impossible to get close to these guys. And I don't know where your your buddy got to. Maybe he just got in a good spot because that the Masters is unlike any other sporting event you cover because you're not allowed cell phone in the golf course and there's no electronic scoreboards. So you miss an awful lot, right? It's like walking back into the 1930s. If you're caught with your cell phone at the Masters, they kick you out right away. And... And so as a broadcaster, when I have to do an hour post show, as soon as it's over, it's really hard for me to walk the course because I, you end up missing so much. There's things going on everywhere. And if I were to follow Tiger, usually the galleries are 25 people deep and I might see the top of his head and that's about it a couple of times. So sadly, most of the time, the last few holes I have to watch on TV from our set and I'm not with the people. Um, I'll try to go out in the morning or watch the first nine holes. But a couple of years ago, I guess first year COVID. So a year ago, November, the masters when there were no fans was uh, probably wasn't great for everybody at home, but for me, it was unbelievable because exactly what you say, there was nobody there. And so I could watch Tiger Woods from 10 feet away. I could hear all the conversations between the caddies and the players. And uh, that for me was an unbelievable masters because I'll never get that sort of access again. There's no one there to yell Brooks at, uh, yeah, uh, DeChambeau. Yeah. And- <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is actually a treat. I'm sure the players, they miss the galleries, but they don't like all the, idiots. well, that's actually the cool thing about the Masters. You don't get the idiots yelling, you know, mashed potatoes and get in the hole because they don't allow it. Uh, it's all polite, polite, polite. <laughs> Um, James, uh, switching gears a little bit, I've heard through the grapevine that you're one of the more disorganized sports casters on TV. Uh, yet when it's showtime, you always pull things together, but, uh, can you give us a little bit of a rundown? Like, do you have sticky notes everywhere or, um, yeah, what's the, what's the deal on this? I think that's fair. I don't know if you got that from Darren Drager or Ray Ferraro or someone, but it's very (laughs) true. I'm very old school. Uh, I don't, uh, have a computer. I'm talking to you right now on an iPad, which I have, and I I use my phone, but I don't type out, you know, what we were talking about earlier about how things are off the cuff. What I do is I I like to handwrite things. So um, we'll have a meeting with our producers and and go over uh, everything that we're going to talk about. Uh, Steve Dryden, who's our, he's the evil quiz master. 
uh, you'll, you'll type out like a four page missive, which will give us a variety of topics that we're going to talk about during the show. And I will, I actually kind of write out the show by hand, which is, it's really, I don't, I don't write it out, but I'll write out. So I'll give you an example. This is probably really too boring for anybody. So I'll put like, uh, like I'll put like OC means on camera and then I'll write. So let's say I'm doing a sense game and I decide I want to talk off the top of the show about the signing of Brady Chuck, right? So I'll think before the show, okay, I want to say this, I want to say this. And I might make a couple of little, little notes of which I can never read them, by the way. I end up going on the air and it looks like <laughs> this. It's just scribble notes. That's what it'll look like. That'll be like a 30 second intro into Brady Kachuk. And then I might write down, okay, Pooley's talking first. And then Dregs is talking second. And, you know, that, that's basically my scripts. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, so it's, I'm sure a lot of people, especially your generation, will look at this and go, this is insane. Uh, but it's, that's the way I like to do things. And I tend to, I always think that there's some connection between the hand and the brain and that when you write things down, it's the same way with studying for exams. I tell all my kids when you're studying to make handwritten notes, because I just feel like you remember things better. So if I write down a couple of notes on paper, I tend to remember it a little bit better because when we do do a pregame show or something, that's 40 minutes long and there's a lot of moving parts involved. I do have to at least know where I'm going basically. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll have three or four or five sheets of paper in front of me and, uh, and that's basically what I'll go on. Is, well, definitely works. If I lose you. those, I'm screwed. <laughs> go ahead, Brendan. I was gonna say, well, it definitely works for you. There's nothing. Uh, I, I don't think you could really sometimes knock the the <laughs> the method to the madness when it's working. So one thing, uh, obviously, we've talked a lot about different experiences that you've had. We talked about covering NHL games, also a, a lot of really really cool experiences return of tiger um i'm curious as well about any events that you might have covered what covered whether they be like outside of north america just because i kind of feel like this question is going to pertain a little more to that but I'm, I'm curious um in different like incredible places if there was any crazy experiences you encountered that wouldn't exactly happen in your routine day to day whether it be in, in canada or just even at the tsn studio so i'm kind of more so thinking like if uh in a different environment uh with different cultures that that uh, might have just been some different misunderstandings or just different complications that might have happened going to certain events or anything like that? Yeah, well, uh, you're definitely right. When you go to Europe for things, it's always a little bit goofier. Uh, I think it was when, you know, we were talking about Vancouver getting the Olympics. That was announced in, in Prague, in the Czech Republic, in... I'm trying to think of the year. I'm going to say 2004, 2005. How, how early do they announce Olympics before the Olympics happens? Somewhere in there, 2006, maybe four or five years before the Olympics. And I, I was fortunate enough to cover that. And that was my first time in Europe, you know, for TSN, I think. Sorry about these dogs who are still going crazy outside. Honey, can you keep these dogs under control? <laughs> Good podcasting right here, isn't it? That's great. <laughs> You're gonna have to like uh I don't know. Can you give him a tranquilizer? <laughs> uh fresh out of those. So I can remember the first time I got in a cab in Prague. So I'm still pretty green at this business and everything. And the guy hands me a big, a big like a, a binder. And I open the binder and there's all these pictures of like a gorgeous, scantily clad women. And I'm like, well, is this just for my entertaining reading in the back seat of the cab? So I'm just browsing through this book and he's trying, he's talking to me in Czech and like, I, I can sort of understand that he's trying to say, which one, which one? And I'm like, what? And I kind of figured out afterwards, or maybe somebody had to tell me that I guess these were professional ladies of the night and I was supposed to pick one out and he would take me to their apartment. And oh, no. uh, so that was my first uh, doctrination to Europe. Uh, um, Beautiful but, city, Prague, though. Yeah, a wonderful <laughs> town. <laughs> Interesting cab rides. Uh, and like, we covered the Olympics in Torino in 2006. And that was a very strange Olympics because we didn't have the rights. 
it was a, I guess, a CBC Olympics, and they still had Hockey Night in Canada back then. And it was Bob McKenzie and Gord Miller and myself. And they did not want us. I can't remember the, I'll get the story slightly wrong, but essentially the CBC, the rights holders had some control over who had uh, credentials to get into the building. And obviously they didn't want the TSN panel in there uh, doing stuff. So we had no accreditation for the Olympics. So we went over and we, we rented a flat and Gord Miller had to go and buy uh, scalpers tickets every day to get us into the rink. So we would go in and we'd buy tickets off scalpers, uh, watch the game, and then go outside the, you know, the walls of the facility to do our panels. So that was uh, just the weirdest thing ever. Uh, and that's how we covered the 2006 Olympic Games. But uh, I mean, I probably, I probably have a million stories for you, but off the top of my head, uh, uh, there's pretty much weird stuff happens whenever you go overseas. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> no, yeah, that's uh, that's completely fair. I guess uh, the <laughs> prog check rides and Ubers in Toronto just just operate a little bit differently. But hey, it's all it's all part of the experience, and I'm happy you got the well, maybe not the full experience. Maybe I'm happy you didn't yeah. get the full experience, but I'm no, happy you got no, no. A, a part of the, the experience. experience. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now there was, you know, there was another. Now that I think of it, now you get me going here. There was a, another night in Prague, and I'm trying to remember. Everyone listening to this podcast is now going to think that all there is in Prague is sex, but I guess that's actually true. But I was really naive, uh, <laughs> young Canadian. Um, I'm trying to think who I went with. It was either a cameraman or uh, uh, another reporter, and we just wanted to get a beer after a long day covering these IOC meetings. And we wa we just walked into a bar, and there's nobody there. Like it was literally me and him. So we just sat down at the bar and ordered a beer, and the Bartender was kind of looking at us funny. And then all of a sudden, within like a couple of minutes, there was like 30 women around us. And I'm like, oh, what is, what is going on here? They just came out of nowhere, like came out of like back doors and walls and things. And the bartender <laughs> spoke a little English. And I, I said, what, like, what the hell is this place? Like, what, what? He goes, well, you pick your girl and uh, you go, you know, you pay me the money and you go in one of the rooms. I'm like, I just want a beer. <laughs> <laughs> is everything every, a cab ride? I can't go for a beer. I can't go for a cab ride without people trying to sell me. Anyway. The fact that it happened Apologies twice. Apologies to your listeners like... that that's all I remember is uh, goofy prog stories. But uh... <laughs> hopefully your wife doesn't listen back, right? No, it's all good. I mean, we left in a second. I feel very uncomfortable in those positions. I'm a very uh, straight laced uh, Ottawa guy. And I was married <laughs> with three kids at home, so I, I needed to get out of there very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think of anything. It's, it's <laughs> it just kind of reiterates that, but that's hilarious. It's, it's good to know that you uh, you can't take a cab and you can't grab a, a yeah. beer in Prague without just being harassed yeah. by uh, their, their version harassed. of pimps, I guess. Sorry, I I'm know. not trying to give Prague a, a bad reputation. I, I love Prague. I haven't been back there since, but uh, Prague is a wonderful city. It's just uh, there was a lot of being thrown at me. Gothic architecture and ladies of the night, Prague. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I guess um, <laughs> while we're bringing up rumors, you guys okay? That, Did that... I just leave you speechless? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I, I, I we're just. Uh, I, I think I thought it was Derek's line. It definitely wasn't. So I'm, I'm, hop, I'm gonna hop back in. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I like I I need to get scribbling down my notes. Apparently, apparently that's what I need around here. Um, so so one guy, you're you're from the Ottawa area. Another guy that um, well currently lives in Ottawa, covers the team, and in our opinion, is is one of the best journalists. And and we think that we're extremely lucky to have him is Ian Mendez. And I know uh, we we got some rumors about you with with your messiness. Uh, we, we've gotten some great stories out of you as well. And I'm just wondering if there's any fun facts or even a little bit of light dirt that you might have on Ian uh, that the Sens fan base would, would, uh, should be aware of, or, I mean, you could also just go on about how good of a guy he is, but we were kind of already aware of that. So. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't think dirt exists on Mendez. I don't like he's, he's just, he's, he, he's pure clean, which is bothers the hell out of me. Cause I wish I had something on him. 
And if He's you guys didn't know anything off the record, you can <laughs> tell me later. But I, I think you're bang on in saying that. Uh, I don't think there's, you know, if you combine reporting skills with quality of humans, there's, I don't think there's any better in the country, basically, than him. And for him to have been there in every capacity now as a TV guy, a radio guy for several years and now uh, writing for The Athletic, uh, you're, you're bang on. I think you're just utmost professional. Um, you know, we both, we, we have in common the sort of journalism background. I, uh, I can remember sitting with Ian, we got, went back and uh, did a, a thing for journalism students uh, a few years ago at Carleton. Uh, where they got to ask us questions. And uh, so I spent sort of the afternoon with the dude. And yeah, I don't, I don't, geez, man, I really wish I had something on him, but he's just a total quality, quality, quality guy. I love the fact that uh, when he was doing TV, people used to yell Farhan Lalji. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's it. That's it. That was amazing. And uh, uh, I would always give him the gears for that, but uh uh, top rate guy, and I hope he stays. I hope he stays in Ottawa for uh, uh, for as long as uh, as he wants to, and as long as career lasts, because he's uh, he's awesome. And it's you know to be able to be really good at three different things like that at TV and radio and writing is uh, is pretty pretty rare and amazing as well. I think we can start a rumor that he sleeps with socks on or something like that, just so we can yes. we can clear him up yes. a little bit. But n- nonetheless, um, l- love love your your take on that. It's kind of just confirming, I think, what a lot of fans uh, have already grown yeah, to it's realize. Yes, but... you know what I mean. Like there's some, <laughs> not there's not many in Canada, but I have met a few phonies along the way in in broadcasting. I would say more south of the border, where you see a guy, and or even in sports, where you think a guy is super nice. And I don't want to, now you're, people are going to say name names. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> off the top of my no. head. I can't think anyone that, you know, that everybody thinks is an awesome person, but when the cameras go off is not as awesome. Um, they're not, I've been really lucky. There's not many at TSN. We have super people around us, but uh, anybody who thought, Hey, Mendez can't be that nice of a person uh, off air. Uh, he truly is. Absolutely. I agree with you there. Um, James, to, to end off, um, we're going to do something a little fun. We're going to do uh, something called Quiz the Quiz Master. <laughs> um, you're, you're always on the other side of things, so we thought it would be cool to switch roles a little bit. Um, awesome. So uh, let's start here. Uh, who will lead the Senators in goals this year? A, Brady Kachuk, B, Tim Stutzla, C, Drake Batherson, or D, Josh Norris? What was it last year? Uh... Give me the totals last year. Last year, Connor Brown actually led the team. Right. I didn't even include Connor Brown. Maybe a little bit of disrespect, but no, I think that he just was a, had, that was a, that he got was really hot. Crazy. Yeah, and I, I mean, it depends with him who plays that second line center. I would say, but and the fact, if like if him and Stutz are the are the wingers on the second line all year, uh, I don't think Connor Brown will lead the team in scoring. But I think that was the two guys I thought were unbelievable like the most eyebrow raising for me last well obviously Norris and Batherson had great years but um the Connor Brown year I still think was one of like the most underappreciated great years in the NHL last year and 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 probably Zub as well who was like at the beginning of the year I'm who the hell is this guy (laughs) like everybody else was and I thought he I thought he was excellent all year long so uh so Connor Brown led the team but was was Drake second or Brady second so Norris uh, Brady and Batherson were all tied with 17 goals. So it's okay. Derek's not leaving it easy on you. I think, you know, Drake went on that crazy run. So I'm, I'm going to say Josh Norris. I just think, uh, ice time wise. And if he stays as the first line center and he stays healthy, uh, I'm just going to go there. I don't, I think it's going to be again, a situation where it's two, three goals apart with, you know, four or five guys, maybe, but I'm going to go Josh Norris. Awesome. On to the next one. You can choose one young player prospect to build your team around. Who do you select? A, Tim Stutzla, B, Quentin Byfield, C, Alexi Lafreniere, or D, Owen Power? No pressure on your answer here. No, I mean, I would I would have said, I'll, I'll say Stutzla, and I'm not sucking up to the, the home crowd. I thought that he was... Uh, um, not the best player in the draft. Like Lafreniere was an obvious number one pick, and Byfield still could. Byfield's still a massive project. 
uh, who could be awesome and and might just be you know a regular sort of NHL guy. I'm not I'm not sure yet, but I thought you know I have a my bias would not be an Ottawa bias. It would be a World Junior bias and a chance to watch Stutzla at those World Juniors. I just thought he was the most impressive player there, two years running basically, and when you know when you get to see a player up close like that and some you know playing you know germany playing canada or the us and they had nobody you know they have two guys basically on their team and he was still they stayed in the game like simply basically because of him uh that knocked my socks off and you know i don't think he had it wasn't the craziest first year last year it was an okay rookie year but i still think uh that that's the guy i would take um uh, you know, Lafreniere will probably prove me wrong. Owen Power, I haven't, I just haven't seen enough of. I, I was super impressed by the World Championship performance to go over there and, you know, have one year of NCAA under your belt and play with men, you know, play with 30 year olds. It was really something else. But uh, I'm going, I'm going Stutzler. No sock, nice. I promise. <laughs> I like how you call when I do the New York Rangers uh, sickos podcast uh, tomorrow night. I'll be like Alexi Lafreniere <laughs> is the obvious choice. How could you choose anyone else? <laughs> Absolutely. Just like um, how you flip to a, be an Islanders fan. So it's, it's just, it's full circle. I'm telling you, I, I don't do this, but there are guys like some of the guys, I swear, some of the analysts that do radio, like regular radio hits in every city. I swear they will change their answers. Like I'm picking playoff series or whatever, for whatever city they're in which is brilliant really true uh provided thomas shabbat produces the most points from the back end this year for ottawa uh who do you finish uh who do you have finishing behind him in points uh a eric brandstrom b artem zub c michael delzato or d victor mete Uh, so what do they have right – is the second pairing supposed to be Delzato and Zaitsev at this point in time? <laughs> that, that's it's... the shutdown pairing. <laughs> that, is, right. that is what it's right. looking like. <laughs> yeah, And then the assuming pairing. Brandstrom makes the team, it's uh, like Brandstrom and like what, Nick Holden or like, something as the third third pairing? Uh, or? Likely. Um, I, I think the brandstrom Zub pairing was pretty great I, last year, but they're trying Zub with Shabbat right now, so it's kind of all just up in the air. Right now, I think Brandstrom's almost on the outside looking in, just based on contracts, because they have a lot of guys there. So he you might notice how I find a way season. to when you guys ask me questions to ask you like nine questions back. <laughs> but you don't you don't completely like you do know the, the fact that you said Zub in your first answer was enough for us to be like this guy knows Ottawa. <laughs> That's all you need so to know is Zub. Who who was the second high scoring defenseman last year behind Shabbat? So let me double check because I, I believe that was also I believe it was Brand, I believe it was Brandstrom, but Zaitsev was close. Or I oh no, Mike Riley. <laughs> yeah, 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 he's no longer. Um, there. And then Zaitsev Zaitsev had seventeen points in fifty five games. Uh, Brandstrom had thirteen points in thirty, but Zub had fourteen Zub and forty seven. So he's he's what right did, there. What did Zub have? Sorry, fourteen in forty seven. And well, Zaitsev was look at. That, that's a tough question. I think there's too many question marks back there uh, as to, so, I mean, if, if Shabbat, if they're trying Shabbat and Zub and that works, and then just by purely ice time and being next to Shabbat, I would take, I would take Zub, but that's just like, obviously he's, he's not there for his offense, but just, I just think that there's too many questions below that as to as to who gets the most ice time and who ends up really being the shutdown pairing and does Branstrom straight stay the entire seat i would take Branstrom on a skill level but i'm still not convinced that uh you know the dj loves him or that he's going to spend the entire season there so i, I just think zoo is the safest pick for a guy who's going to get a ton of ice time James, I'll, I'll give you a, a much easier question for the last one here. So we, we know that you're a dog guy. Now we're going to leave Frenchies out of it because they're, they're just going to be the obvious choice. But we want to ask you the question of what is your favorite breed of these four dogs? A, Golden Retrievers. B, Pugs. C, Corgis. D, Great Danes. Great Danes. Uh, I, I've always wanted a Great Dane. A Dregs has one. Uh, but my wife likes the little dogs and uh, they're, they're just, they're massive, but there's 
we were a couple in our neighborhood and just some of the sweetest dogs out there for this size. It's, it's hilarious. I'll take, I have a Boston and two Frenchies. If you put Boston Terrier in there, that would have been my choice. But uh, uh, these Great Danes like are terrified of my little tiny Frenchie, which I just find hilarious. So Great Dane all the way. Sometime in my life, I will have a Great Dane. Awesome stuff. James Duthie, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. <laughs> what a pleasure talking to you. Anytime you want to come back, man, just uh, just hit me up and let me know. Uh, it was amazing talking to you. Uh, Brennan and Derek, thanks so much for having me. And uh, a story that I was uh, elusive in the summertime of <laughs> tracking me down because I tend to disappear as soon as the free agency day happens and uh, turn off my phone for a month and a half. But uh, a pleasure being on with you guys. And uh, uh, every time that some person in an airport or whatever says, um, James Doofy to the counter, please. Thank you guys, because it does happen pretty much all the time. <laughs> awesome stuff. Thank you so much, man. No, thank you okay, so much, boys. James. It's truly a pleasure. Take care. Okay, guys. Thanks, boys. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, James. Thank you so much. And, sorry about uh, the dog, man. <laughs> no, oh, don't be sorry. Don't be it sorry. Adds at all. to the show. <laughs> all the best. Take it easy. Take care. Take care. All right, that was James Duthie, um, the, the <laughs> one and only. Um, so just before we carry on, we're just going to go to a quick ad break from our sponsors here. So, okay. Hey, hey, this is Brennan from the Future Sickos podcast. I enjoy watching hockey, but I also enjoy winning money watching hockey. If you would like to have the chance of winning thousands of dollars every week, Sign up for DraftKings account using promo code THPN. All right. So that was definitely one of the more engaging interviews I think that we've ever had. Definitely a bit of a, a switch up. It wasn't as much Ottawa Senators based. But with that being said, James has a terrific amount of knowledge about Ottawa. And I honestly just just a major thank you to James for coming on the show. That was truly a pleasure. Um, I don't know which story you want to dissect first because I feel like there's quite a range of of different different great ones, or you kind of just want to leave them as they are, Derek. I'll, I'll put the ball in your court for that. Yeah, honestly, man, that was probably my favorite interview. I just think um just the the amount of stories, and it seems like he just had so many more too. Um, that, you know, you could literally spend, you know, I can listen to that guy talk for hours and hours and not be bored. So, um, terrific interview. Um, we can't thank him enough for coming on the show. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we, if we have time to really, you know, dive into every story. I realize that there's, uh, there's actually a game on, I think right now, I don't, I don't even know what time. Yeah, there's a game on right now. So everyone is probably, uh, watching the first, uh, preseason hockey game of the season, um, I don't know. It, it, it's up to you. We can, we can definitely, uh, touch on some of the stuff we can touch on the Logan Brown thing. What do you want to do? Oh yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's dabble a little bit. Nothing, nothing good ever happens in the first, uh, what, 20, 10 minutes of an Ottawa Senators game. It seems at least that's the way it was last year to be, to start the season, but hopefully they proved me wrong on that. No, absolutely. Um, so uh, with the, the Logan Brown trade, let's, uh, let's go there. Um, uh, you know, that's a, a little bit of news coming out uh, just before the season starts. It, you know, we said it before that it was probably inevitable that he would get traded. Um, so he does get traded to uh, to St. Louis. Zach Sanford coming back the other way. Um, and the fourth round pick, the condition on that is that Logan Brown plays 30 games for St. Louis this year, which, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hit and miss. I don't know. He hasn't stayed healthy the, the past few seasons. Brennan, what do you think about the trade um, overall? Well, first of all, I just think that the condition in there is hilarious. Um, I know you and I were talking about that before, but the fact that they had to make it 30 games specifically, and it's essentially them betting on whether or not Logan Brown is an NHL player or not. Um, it's a fourth row pick, so it's not, it's not much of a big price, but... I want to say that I, I like the trade. I think that it was necessary. I think it had to happen. I really had high hopes for Logan Brown. And then I think I got kind of stale. I don't want to necessarily say sour, but it was a little, it was kind of one of those other things where since there was a lot of other guys that stepped up, we were kind of lucky to be able to move on from him. And 
it was looking like we weren't going to get much for him. It was looking like we were probably maybe going to get like a mid round pick in return. That was kind of all it was. I know you and I spoke about just kind of hold on to him for a bit longer until we can get some, some sort of return, but we're getting a guy who can slate into the bottom six and do a good job. He's won a cup. He had a pretty great pace. I know that you pointed that out the season before last, before COVID came on, he was, he was producing at a pretty high clip. So he's a guy that can play those tough minutes, not afraid to fight, but he can also put up some points, which is, which is awesome. And that's something that it's kind of hard to find. Like it's hard to find guys that you really trust in that bottom six that can also produce. So I, I like Sanford. I like what he brings to the team. I think that it's an interesting move. I wish Logan Brown, nothing but the best. I know that, there was a lot of concerns and I know personally just from watching him and coming up with the Kitchener Rangers as well, I've always kind of questioned just uh, the drive and the work ethic there. And and maybe a change of scenery is exactly what he needs to be able to kind of bring that out, light, light a bit of a fire under him and, uh, and really get him kind of pushing himself to, to the next level. No, absolutely. I think St. Louis, you know, what they're getting is probably the player with the higher upside uh, of the two. Um, but that being said, there's no guarantee that Logan Brown even becomes an NHL player with the injury history. And like you said, um, sometimes just blatantly taking nights off, um, you know, that, that was a concern. Um, uh, but, but it was also, you know, a, a matter of the player not really buying into the system and, and really the system not really, you know, buying into Logan Brown and sort of what he was, because I think the senators are building a team with a reputation of, you know, working hard and, being hard to play against. And Logan Brown just quite frankly, isn't that he's, he's a skilled player. Um, and I'm not saying he can't be a good player. Like you said, I think the change of scenery is, is good here for everybody. Um, and on the flip side, getting back Sanford, I think, um, you know, as you mentioned, he's a, you, you, a player that you can utilize um, down in your lineup, but uh, also a player that if you need to can play a little bit higher up in your lineup, I think, um, he has a really good shot. Like I'd be surprised if they don't try him at least on the second power play. So um, I think, you know, it, it all but ends Parker Kelly's probably chances at making the team this year. Um, but I think Sanford is definitely an upgrade over a player like Kelly at this stage in his career. So um, he's here for a season. We'll see what he can do. I know uh, St. Louis fans uh, didn't really like him <laughs> for, to, to be frankly honest, you know, uh, reading through the comments, um, I guess there was some really blatant defensive lapses that he had. But um, but on the flip side, again, when you look through the analytical numbers, um, he's actually quite a good defensive player. So um, I'm not too concerned. I think, you know, in, in my mind, Ottawa wins the trade. Um, but of course, like I said, on, on the St. Louis end, there's the potential upside. And, and it's a player that sort of fell out of uh, interest in the fan base on their side as well. So it's a good hockey trade for Dorian. Definitely a great hockey trade. Uh, also, he's a good friend of Colin White. They played together at Boston College. And now I, I know that, or was it BU? I always mix up those two. But with that being said, um, I, I know how much we value good friendships and, and everything, all that chemistry on the team. So um, hopefully he gels really well with the team. I One thing I am curious about is, do you think that this acquisition means that the Ottawa Senators see themselves as being done in terms of trying to trade for someone uh, or at least a forward, whether it be that right wing we were talking about basically all summer, maybe a top, uh, a top center. I don't know if they're even going to be able to get one at this point. Do you think that that pursuit is over or, or do you think that this was kind of just uh, a bit of an opportunity that, that they were going to take and, and that they're still looking for something else? Yeah, I think uh, Logan Brown, I think that whole situation was isolated. I, I see it as as something like a separate entity from actually going out and acquiring, you know, a, a top end player as they, they once suggested throughout the summer. Um, I do feel like they're still very much looking to, to make a play before the season starts. Um, now, you know, I, I also don't think they're willing to pay, you know, maybe what they, the asking price is for one of those players right now. So uh, they might be waiting for the price to go down, but at the same time, just seeing um, if one of their players, you know, maybe like a Sokolov um, is ready internally first. So I think they they want to go through a little bit of camp first. Obviously, their main focus right now is getting Brady Kachuk signed. And uh, the latest reports on that is that, you know, they could potentially still be looking at a long-term uh, contract. So they haven't quite shifted to the bridge contract yet. 
which I think is a big deal. Um, you know, if, if they're able to hash out a long-term contract still at this stage, um, cause I think, you know, personally, I predicted like if you get into training camp and into the preseason now, um, we're more and more likely looking at a bridge contract, but, um, you know, are, are the senators still actively pursuing someone? I think so. I, I don't, you know, I, I look down the middle and I just don't see a lot of strength and there's a lot of question marks on this team heading into the season. And this is a team that wants to take a step forward. So I think they're aware of that. Awesome. And since you brought it up with the birdie deal, I, I am curious in, in your opinion, I, I know that there's been a lot of talk going around as to what exactly could be holding it up. And I, I think a major focus of that is really kind of shifted to signing bonuses as well as kind of just the structure of the pay. And I'm curious if if you personally believe that that is kind of the, the main hurdle that, that they're working to work out. And what do you think it would mean to Brady as well as maybe other young players on the team if they were able to pay him some some decent size signing bonuses and to structure that into a deal? Do you think that that's a major reason for optimism? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, if if the Senators are able to sign Brady long term, I think that's still the most desired outcome, even if you're overpaying the player. So even if we're looking at a contract that's, you know, maybe north of eight point four, eight point five million dollars a season, um, if you can get Brady locked up long term, that has a huge impact on other players coming up, players like Josh, Josh Norris, who shares the same agent as Brady Kachuk. So um, yeah, the, the signing bonus thing, this, the salary structure, I think that's what everyone or, or for the most part, people believe is holding the thing up. Um, but, but we really don't know, like, you know, that could be what's holding it up. Maybe it's not. Um, I think it's an educated guess that, you know, that could be that that money up front is something that, you know, Melnick just doesn't really have to fork out. And, um, if that's the problem, it's a real shame that they, they can't, you know, compete with all the other teams basically that can, that can front that money. Um, so it would be a real shame if that's ultimately what leads to a bridge contract. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've said it before a bridge contract, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, but the one thing you don't want to do is disrespect the player. Like Brady Kachuk is an integral piece, uh, piece of the puzzle here. Um, likely, as we said before, going to be the next captain. Um, so if, if you can get him locked up to eight years, um, you know, you, you got to do everything you can to get that done in my mind. One thing I want to talk to you about, because I know that if there's anyone in the auto center space, I know that Liam's Martian's been all over the rookie camp preseason. A lot of people, there's a lot of excitement about the development camp, the pre preseason, um, and now preseason as it just started 15 minutes ago. And I'm really curious, Derek, of people who were a bright spot for you in, in the games that you watched. I know that you were very vocal about how you felt that Eric Brandstrom looks like he deserves a spot on this team um, in that he, he's playing to a clip where he deserves a serious look. And I'm curious if you could just kind of give your opinions of um, who, who you think has really stood out and who maybe has been a bit of, I don't know if it's a dis disappointment or maybe just who you think should maybe not be the first choice on the Ottawa Senators come, come opening night based on what you've seen so far in development camp and the intra squad games and everything. You know, I'll, I'll start by copping out and saying that it's a little too early and we have to watch um, a lot more of the preseason and, and just see how it unfolds because, you know, you have the rookie showcase, which was good and, and really competitive, to be honest. Uh, there was a couple of really competitive games there against Montreal um, and then the internal, you know, the inner squad game, I thought it was really competitive for an inner squad game, but, um, but at the same time, you're still playing against your own team. So um, you, you can't really make heads or tails of anything just yet. Um, obviously, yeah, I said Brandstrom was a standout for me in the inner, inner squad game. I don't know how he wasn't a standout for me. He's, you know, way above what they brought in uh, anything they brought in in the off season. But again, we, we just need to see sort of how this thing plays out in the preseason. Um, because I know their concerns with Brandstrom, obviously it's not offense, it, it's on the defensive side of things. And if he can box out and so on and so forth, and then having another undersized player like Mete, they don't really want to have too many of those guys on the back end. Um, so I, I can see things from their perspective as well. Um, the standout for me, the, the one big standout, I mean, we've talked about him a lot, but Igor Sokolov, I think, you know, just continues to, to produce. I mean, every game that he's played in so far, he's been producing. 
Um, and he just looks like a, a difference maker out there for the most part. Now, now he's a big, heavy body. He's got to work on his mobility still. Um, consistency at the NHL level, I don't know if it will be there yet. I don't know if he's quite ready to make the jump. But uh, I, I think we have a player there. I think, you know, um, when they drafted him, there, there was no certainty at all. I mean, he was an overage player that was drafted, and it was kind of a, you know, maybe a reach, maybe a gamble a little bit. But uh, quickly, you know, personality-wise, people started falling for that player. Um, but now the player himself, I mean, and the on-ice product has, has come so far. And you could see just, just how far that guy is and how fun he is to watch. And I think, you know, that'll be a player to watch out for um, if you're looking at anyone that could potentially maybe make the jump this year and make the team. Um, I think by adding Sanford, there, there really isn't a whole lot of room to add, you know, one of the younger players to the squad. Um, there still seems to be a potential spot on that right wing, which is why I highlighted Sokolov. The back end is clogged up as well. So, um, you know, my hope is that Brandstrom leaves uh, the, the Senators with no choice. You know, he goes out in the preseason and he shows them that he's way above, um, you know, other players that are currently slotted above him. Um, the, the, the one piece you asked for, a disappointment, I would say um, it, it's not a shocker, but Michael Delzato, I mean, I was never a fan of, of the signing to begin with. And I know... Uh, Duffy actually just just mentioned, you know, how much he liked Delzato. And I think he's probably a really likable person and, and someone that the Senators really want in the dressing room. But how many times have we heard that in the last couple of seasons? And then you end up with a player who's just just sort of blocking uh, a younger talent from making the team. And the younger talent in a lot of ways is better. We've seen, you know, how much the mobility to the de defense added um, just to, to the overall team play at the end of the season. And I think um, blocking a player like Brandstrom is not the smartest choice in my mind. It's a very hard dilemma. I, I think listening to what DJ Smith had to say during his press conference and just kind of stating that, you know, like now that this is a team that wants to compete every single night and compete out, outwork teams on more nights that they don't. I, I think that it's hard because that's when, the veterans are kind of the ones that that get that look and um the the younger guys are kind of seen as you know like this is your competition you really have to earn your spot but you do also have to wonder if there's a bit of a pressure there to play veterans that that were acquired or signed or brought in or at least kind of give them that that benefited the doubt i know that there was comments kind of made about i know what veterans bring so i'm not looking at them as much as i'm looking at the younger players and i think that might be difficult but nonetheless i i do definitely agree with the fact that brandstrom has to earn his spot um no matter what i i do think that having mete there might complicate things a little bit i know that mete has earned his spot since he's been there so it's been it's been difficult and um i mean both of us are obviously very high on eric brandstrom so we're, we're hoping to nothing but the best, but yeah, hopefully he can kind of just go out there and show that this team needs him and that he's going to give them a chance to win every single night. Yeah. And if you don't love Brandstrom long-term, like, you know, I, I've said this before, if you don't love him long-term, that's fine, but at least boost his trade value. I mean, this is a player who I think is quite capable of being a top four defenseman this year. Um, and if you're trading from a position of power, you know, you're trading a, a top four defenseman, who's legitimately came into the league and proved it, you're, you're trading a different player than, you know, trading a player with potential. Um, so I think the Senators can do themselves a lot of favors, even if they don't see Brandstrom um, in the picture long-term. Definitely. And just one last thing here that we'll touch on kind of before we, we log off and maybe catch some Ottawa Senators hockey, because I know that you're, you're probably extremely keen. I know that I am as well to get it on, but um, we just want to send out our, our, best wishes in his recovery process to Angus Crookshank. I, I know Derek and I, we both have nothing but the most respect for that guy. We really are rooting for him to make the team. And honestly, I thought that he had a decent chance of making the team. I feel like he was kind of the exact player that that could work his way on. He works so hard. He has offensive skill. He's grind, gritty. He's not the biggest guy, but he plays like he's six foot five. He's got a lot of Brendan Gallagher in his game. And I mean, I don't like Brendan Gallagher, but I'd like Brendan Gallagher if he was on my team. So um, it, it's, it's really, really brutal, obviously, with that double uh, ACL, MCL surgery that he's having to go through. You don't even want one of those, let alone both. But 
all the best. That guy has an insane amount of work ethic. So if there's anyone that's going to be able to kind of get through that injury and continue to keep grinding and, and just recover and continue to grow his game, it's Angus and j- just wish him nothing but the best. Yeah. Just completely second what you, what you said there when he went down, I was so disappointed because he was having such a good game too. Um, he was just, he, he's a tenacious player. Um, you know, I've loved him ever since I started watching him in Belleville. Um, he immediately, you know, brought a ton to the table. He has that chemistry with Sokolov as well. Um, just a, a really fun player to watch. He, he's a ball of energy. Um, and yeah, you know, hopefully he'll heal quickly and, and still get a little bit of playing time in Belleville before the season's up. And, and then, you know, next year can, can come at it and maybe make the team out of camp. That would be you know, best case scenario for Angus. And like you said, we wish him nothing but the best. Awesome. Thank you so much for everyone tuning in for this episode. We, we truly appreciate your support as always. And we look forward to just creating more and more content for you as the season starts up.